This is the No Stroke Podcast with your co-hosts, David Dancero and Michael Garrow, helping you to support and thrive in life after stroke. Their podcast is designed for educational and community support purposes only and should not replace medical treatment and guidance of your own health professional team. Welcome to episode 51 of the No Stroke Podcast. I'm Dave Dancero. I'm here with my co-host, Mike Garrow. <clears throat> Mike, how does it feel to be in the 50s? Uh, I mean, you would know. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I knew I was going to uh, come set, back at me. You, I knew set I set myself up. up. You set me up. Um, <laughs> Over no, the top. Hap- yeah. Happy with it. You know, I think, you know, I shared a post there on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. After we released the episode with Dr. Richards. Um, yeah. I mean, 50 was a milestone. We both had our eye on for a bit and looking forward to keeping, keeping the show going. Absolutely. 100 coming next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I, I, um, I just had, um, I had a couple of quick things. One, I want to wish, uh, her reports about a week, week and a half ago that Jamie Foxx, actor Jamie Foxx had an event on, on set. And it turned out there are now multiple reports are showing up that he had a pretty serious stroke, apparently, um, that, um, he's under in, in hospital care for now. So, um, just wanted to, you know, wish wish them well and, and you know it's just goes to show you know stroke can happen to anyone right so um he's at, at oh. i was gonna say and there's you know probably a lot of folks out there who've had a stroke this week and you know because they're not jamie fox aren't yeah. getting the headlines but i think what it shows each time uh you know a list or you know so celebrity or someone of quote unquote influence you know kind of has this event it just brings out you know the the need for more support. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, as, as you alluded to kind of wishing him well and hoping the best for his recovery, but yeah, it's, uh, it's something that could happen to everybody. Right. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. um, the other just quick point is there's a new update for our YouTube channel and YouTube as a, as a whole, they're getting into the podcast space more, Uh, seriously, I guess, and they're going to be indexing podcasts. So when you go to our YouTube channel now at No Stroke, um, you'll see there's another tab next to playlists for podcasts. So eventually that's going to, they're going to grow that platform. And, you know, we don't, uh, we talked about maybe doing some shorts or doing other things to get a little more engagement there, but it is nice to, you know, to have those up there. And we usually follow each episode with the YouTube version uh, about a week after we drop the episode. So that's kind of um, what's new on the, on, on, on the podcast front there. Yeah. And for the podcast, obviously, you know, it works in this, or sorry for YouTube, it works in the same sense with, you know, the podcast, obviously it's the same conversation, just you get to see, you know, our faces on YouTube. So if you actually want to see our faces, I mean, <laughs> great, great opportunity, but it's um, I was going to say just, you know, you could still subscribe and I believe there is a, a notification button on there as well, a little bell. So when you click that, every time we release a show on YouTube, you'll be notified there. So yep. um, yeah, we'd love for folks to you know tune in. I think we'll have uh, our episode with Dr. Richards out, you know, over the next couple of days. Um, in the news for me, uh, we, you know, obviously the, the joy, kind of the the excitement that we had um, when we were nominated here for the stroke heroes award um, under the voters choice category, Um, they've started to release a few of the winners. Um, So it looks like pro medica stroke network out of Toledo, Ohio won the voters choice award. Um, So kudos out to those folks uh, and could be a great, you know, a podcast episode, talk to the competition, well, <laughs> the competition, <laughs> not really, are you? not really, but um, yeah, would, you know, we'd love to have those folks on and kind of speak to some of their accomplishments. For sure. And and I know you're the competitive side of you, you know, you take a couple of breaths, you'll be good. It, you, you did very well, Mike, you did very well, very well Thank for, you. for, Thank for, you. for uh, some real good competition and really some great advocacy efforts were for everyone that got nominated. Mm-hmm. So it'd be great to have them on as well. Mm-hmm. Totally. So yeah, let's kind of get into today's guest. So today we're speaking with Dr. Mark Powell. Um, he is a biomedical engineer by background, studied at Brown University, uh, a lot of his doctoral work looked at applying techniques in now 
I'm going to read this. I don't know what half of it means, <laughs> but <laughs> applying techniques in wireless power transfer, radio frequency electronics, and low power embedded systems toward the development of wireless and plantable neural neural interfaces designed to enable synchronous multi-area access to the nervous system. <laughs> One breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, he's now kind of taken this research of everything that I said there, and I'm sure everyone, you know, completely understands um, and has applied that into a research project out at the University of Pittsburgh, where he and his team have released a, a, an initial kind of preliminary study, which came out in February of this year. And in this study kind of showed hope, granted the study was two participants, but one participant was nine years post stroke. And, you know, it was really a revolutionary kind of outcome that was seen here, right? Um, pretty much they use this neurotechnology of um, spinal stimulation. And it's improved you know, arm and hand mobility, really enabling people that have been that are affected by stroke to get back to some of their normal activities. Um, and again, this was all out of University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, there, as Mark will get into, it's preliminary. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, but you know, for those who are still wondering what the heck this is, um, it's a kind of pair of thin metal electrodes, kind of from what this article says, resembling strands of spaghetti implanted along the neck, engaging intact neural circuits. Um, and that's been shown to allow stroke patients to fully open and close their fist, um, lift their arm above their head, or use a fork and knife to cut a piece of steak, right, for the first time in years. Um, and that's what one stroke survivor really alluded to. And, you know, we've we know best. I mean, you've worked with a ton of stroke patients. You've, mm -hmm. you know, seen the deficits. I, I see it with my mom and future uh, mother-in-law. You know, they both suffer from spasticity and kind of limited range of motion within, you know, with their arm. Um, so it's, yeah, it's groundbreaking, really. Um, so what we discuss here is, you know, the research that went into this, um, and also what was recently announced about two two weeks ago at this point, maybe three, um, this, you know, Mark, Mark Powell and the, the company that's now spun out of this research, um, called neuro uh, uh, blanking on the name, reach yeah. neuro, reach neuro. Uh, yep. Thank you. Um, they applied for FDA fast track, uh, recognition, right? So this is going to help them, you know, and, and Dr. Powell will get into it, but it really helps accelerate, this device through additional research and getting into the market in the hands of more and more stroke patients. So really um, technical interview, would you agree with that, David? I mean, yeah. we, we yeah. got to the weeds with a lot of stuff, but I, I mean, fascinating discussion, fascinating research that again, you know, as, and I think we wrapped up the episode with Mark saying like, it just, provide so much optimism, you know, knowing Absolutely. this stuff is out there and, and these folks are researching. So, and we, we um, made a comparison to, cause this is now, I think we said this is our second um, group that had breakthrough device designation by the FDA. But, um, and, and I, I remember that you uh, pointed out uh, med rhythms, um, but I believe it, um, neurolutions we had oh, in one of yeah, our top right. 10 episodes. So yeah. um, I guess you could say we are on the cutting edge there, Mike, because we're, you know, we're doing something, right? We're I doing don't know. something. Uh, no, but this was really, this was really a, a great um, interview. And, and I think Mark was, well, he'll, we'll get into it with him that he was, he, he fit us in. He was, he's, he's been traveling all over as part of this process of, of, of launching this new yeah, you know, moving so. from academic, yeah. you know, world into this, you know, startup space is a challenge. But, you know, one thing that stuck out to us both, like, he knows the pain points, right? He knew he knows exactly, you know, you could tell he's spoke and kind of, you know, he, he understands what that lived experience entails for stroke patients, the providers and caregivers. So as you know, 
technical as this might have gotten to some degree, like he has that empathy to know what to build and how to build it. Yep. Well said. So let's, uh, what do you say we bring him in? Let's do it. I'm recording the backup, so we're ready to go. We'll rock and roll. Set. Here we go. Three, two, oh, one. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry, sorry, oh. sorry. Did you go to the cloud or did you go to? Uh, I'm I'm recording local. <clears throat> All right, I'll go to the cloud. Sweet. Good again. Here we All go. Right. Three, two, one, go. All right. Good evening, Mark, and welcome to the No Stroke Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've talked about you guys, your your company, and the news that came out. Just it was in February, I believe the the study uh, finished up around um, this breakthrough, you know, technology here. To well, it's been a technology that's been around for a while, and I think that's something we want to talk about. Um, but you've applied, um, you know, spinal stimulation to within a small study um, that's showing some amazing results. And you know, you recently just got your FDA FDA approval for fast track recognition. So. You know, we're, we're there's a lot to cover here, um, but you know, before we get into the meat and bones of the study and you know this technology, uh, and how you could you know really see this potential growing for stroke rehab, um, let's let's just cover your background a bit. You know, where I think you're calling us from San, San Francisco today, but you're based in uh, Pittsburgh. Um, so let's you know share with the audience a little bit about yourself, kind of your upbringing, your university track, and kind of what got you to where you are today with Richard Nero. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, actually, um, and went to Georgia Tech there for biomedical engineering, which is really where I got interested in the brain and in neuroscience and neurotechnology um, as kind of this sort of last frontier, if you will, of the human body. You know, we it's still something that science hasn't been able to fully explain, and we're not even really that close. So it's an exciting area to be part of. Uh, I then went to um, Brown University for my PhD, where I worked on building the devices that let us interact with the nervous system, so neural interfaces. Uh, and these either let us read information from the nervous system or write information to the nervous system. Um, that led to a postdoctoral um, job at University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon, where I led a clinical study there um, to look at spinal cord stimulation for helping stroke stroke uh, survivors use their arm and hand again. And that actually is the study that was published recently and is what led to the company uh, REACH. All right, so th thanks for that background, um, Mark. And it, you know, you've been in this world of research and you know, now the startup world, which you know, coming from academics and getting into research, a lot of challenges, right? A lot of different bureaucracy things you're dealing with. So I can imagine you're a, uh, want a busy and probably a little stressed out man at the moment. Uh, so what do you do to kind of kick back, relax and, you know, dis disconnect from, you know, the, the day to day? Yeah, I, I love photography. Uh, so I, I think that it helps me kind of disconnect because I'm always looking kind of anywhere you go, there can be a picture. So I'm always kind of looking and really helps me see the world around me in a, in a very different way because I'm looking for these types of images. Uh, so that's really what helps me re uh, you know, unwind when I go taking pictures uh, on the weekends and even the process of editing them can be a nice distraction. I, I'm very interested in your background. It sounds like uh, you spent a little time in my neck of the woods. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Cumberland. You were in uh, Brown University for a while in Providence. So um, yep. well, welcome to the show, Mark. And um, I'm uh, as a PT, I'm, 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 in, I'm very interested in what you're doing. Um, and can you tell for our audience a little bit about before we dump into the technology that you're working on is the history behind uh, spinal cord stimulation or for, you know, I'm familiar with it for pain and, and that type of thing. But can you um, kind of give that, you know, explain the different types of, of stim and, and how it's used in clinical practice today? Sure. Yeah. So uh, spinal cord stimulation has been used clinically based since the 1980s, really. It's um, been around mostly to treat chronic pain, which is actually uh, the current largest neuromodulation market, even compared to other technologies like deep brain stimulation. Um, 
And uh, I think there's kind of two different types of spinal cord stimulation that you might hear about. Um, one is what we're doing called epidural uh, spinal cord stimulation. That's when the, the electrodes are implanted right near uh, the spinal cord and you get very precise stimulation. Uh, there's also something called transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation where the electrodes are placed external on the body and the goal is to stimulate the spinal cord um, via those uh, electrodes. It's a little less specific, but it's also doesn't require an implant, which is why it attracts uh, some, some individuals. Um, so yeah, chronic pain is the current way that these devices are used and kind of a distinction between what we're doing and, and chronic pain. Uh, you, you know, you can imagine that trying to treat chronic pain is, a, a, it's a one dimensional question. It's does the pain, is it there? Does it hurt or does it not hurt? Um, when trying to apply spinal cord stimulation for movement, which is really this, a, a relatively new field, um, there's a question of how do you balance all of the, um, the effects that you get across the different joints of the arm and the hand. And that's really where um, sort of this technology, the, the innovation behind this technology is focused is in how do we take this technology, you know, spinal cord stimulation, something that is used um, all the time now uh, for chronic pain, but in a very different way. And that's kind of the, the crux of what this study was looking at and kind of what our company is building. Okay. So I think that gives us, you know, some good context into, you know, how this has been used in practice. Um, you know, and you're, you were explaining a lot of your early work within research, you're actually looking at, all right, how does this impact stroke patients particularly, right? And, you know, I'd love to, you know, for you to kind of explain the early research, like how did, what were, what was some of the ideation, the kind of early phase of this research that's ultimately now led to, to what you've built and the, and the, you know, the study that came out um, most recently um, showing the impacts of, of this device for restoring upper arm movement. Sure. Yeah. So, so there's good reason to believe that uh, stimulating the spinal cord could have uh, motor effects, so movement effects. Um, you know, the signals that um, are used to tell your arms and, and legs how to move originate in the brain, um, but they're sent through the spinal cord and ultimately out through the must through to to the muscles via the spinal cord. Um, and so all the neural circuits, all the cells that are involved in making those movement happen are actually in the spinal cord. So that's that's why we kind of had this idea that maybe uh, targeting the spinal cord could could be the right place. Um, but there's a lot of, of background in this technology, um, actually in spinal cord injury um, patients, and there's some recent stuff in cerebral palsy as well. Um, that we're looking at spinal cord stimulation, mostly for lower limbs, so walking uh, effects. And actually one of our co-founders, Marco Capagrosso, um, spent his entire academic career um, before he started his lab at the University of Pittsburgh, looking at um, lower limb function and spinal cord injury patients using spinal cord stimulation there. So, um, you know, in some ways we, we could rely on a lot of the work that had already been done by Marco and others uh, in that space. But then when we transition to upper limb and in stroke, there's really a couple interesting questions that we weren't sure about going into our study. Uh, the first is that um, in stroke, the damage to the nervous system is done in a different part of the nervous system. So it's in the brain versus spinal cord. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that, uh, that this technology worked in those situations as well, which it looks like it does. Uh, and number two, in upper limb, um, the movements that you do with your arms and hands are relatively complex movements. You can imagine reaching for a glass of water, grabbing it, picking it up. Um, those, those require a level of coordination that can't be um, pre-programmed, if you will. Whereas in the lower limbs and legs, um, walking is a very rhythmic, cyclic thing. And so you actually have circuits in the spinal cord that generate those rhythmic movements of the muscles, and you can leverage that um, pattern in your stimulation to kind of help. So one thing we weren't sure going into the study about was if this stimulation would also help um, in upper limb function. And that was really what we were excited to see um, work well in the, in the study. I'm trying to um, wrap my head around the, the, the complexity of the arm, hand, and shoulder having all work in what you mentioned, it's like a symphony, really, when when those ha when those things happen yeah. automatically. But when when we're trying to rebuild those circuits, 
is your technology listening in the background for those signals that are still there? How, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yes. So um, the, the reason that um, someone ends up with a motor impairment after stroke um, is uh, usually correlated with damage to a particular part of the nervous system called the corticospinal tract, which connects uh, the cortex, motor cortex um, to the spinal cord. Um, but very rarely is that um, a complete transection. In other words, there are still some signals that can make their way down. Um, and what our technology does, um, kind of unintuitively actually, we're not stimulating the neurons that are involved in actually cr creating the movement itself. Those are called motor neurons. Instead, we're stimulating the sensory neurons that would normally be used to bring sensory information from the periphery um, up to your brain, but those also connect inside the spinal cord to these motor neurons. And so we can connect the motor neurons by stimulating the, the sensory neurons. Um, and why that's really interesting is because, um, so, you know, the brain is still sending these signals down. Um, they're just weaker um, because of the, the stroke. And so they can't actually cause the, the movement they used to. What we do with our stimulation is through these sensory neurons, we um, cause the motor neurons to be more receptive to that weaker signal. So in the end, um, the brain is still doing the control here. So it feels like a very naturalistic movement to the individual who's doing it because the brain is still doing all that, you know, coordination that is so complicated. And so we don't actually need to, to record and try and figure out what the brain wants to do and, and do something uh, because of that. Instead, we just apply this stimulation in a way that allows the brain to take back control of those movements. And that's the that's a really important piece that this is these are voluntary movements. Essentially, if someone um, didn't intend to make a movement, they won't. It's when they use their brain to say, okay, I'm going to move my arm now uh, that the movement actually occurs. Yeah. And, you know, as I was kind of reading some of these outcomes, especially from this first study, you know, the, the respondents that, that you, or, you know, the, the folks that you had within this clinical trial, I mean, the optimism and just the hope that came from this was remarkable, you know, just to hear some of these stories. So, you know, it's granted, you know, and I, I think one thing that, you know, I'm curious around is the we could get into the study design and kind of the the outcomes of the study. But, um, you know, starting off, I guess, as we kind of get into more of the study itself, like, is there a reason that this was limited or like that there were only two individuals in the study? Like, does that limit the, you know, some of this potential outcome? Or yeah, I was just curious around yeah. that choice. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it is important to recognize that this is a preliminary study with right now a relatively small sample size. The study, however, um, actually is is ongoing, and we're collecting more data um, every day for that. Uh, so you know, over time, uh, you'll see more and more patients' worth of data coming out. The reason that we chose to publish the results when we did, um, even for just the first two patients. Um, were that we really thought that the field needed to see that this that this works the way that it does. We felt that the results were powerful enough, even with those two patients, um, that it was worth um, kind of telling the field about. But you're right, there's still a lot of research um, to be done here, and I, I want to be clear that that that's the case. Uh, you know, I don't want to make any claims that we're um, you know solving everything today, um, but it is exciting, and I think that we wanted to share that with the scientific community. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that, and that makes sense, right? Like this is it's and it was the first, if I have this right, it was the first human-centered uh, study for upper for this type of technology used for upper arm, you know, restoration. And you know, I I mentioned some of these patients, sorry, but would you like to kind of share some of the feedback and you know the the actual outcomes from some of these patients? Yeah, so I think the most exciting outcomes. Uh, are really around function. So we measured a lot of different things as part of the study from muscle strength to um, smoothness of motor control. But uh, obviously the most you know, impactful thing is can this person now do something that they couldn't do before? Um, so the first participant who uh, entered the study, her name is Heather. She's been a part of some of the news coverage after the paper. Um, and she came to the study. We asked her, uh, what is the 
if you could do one thing at the end of this that you can't do now, what would it be? And she she said she wanted to cut a steak with a fork and a knife and feed herself steak. Um, and uh, by the end of the study, she was able to do that, uh, which was amazing. I mean, the, that moment um, truly was one of the most gratifying of my research career. I worked a lot. I didn't work in um, in a human model uh, prior to this. And so getting the ability to see what this technology can do in the immediate <laughs> near term to help people um, was really, really impressive uh, and just satisfying to see. Um, her, her parents came to a lot of those uh, studies as well. So they saw all of this. There's a video that um, I often show to kind of demonstrate these results. And uh, Heather's dad is standing in the back with his his cell phone recording this on a video of of Heather doing these things. So it was really cool to kind of see the whole family there and, and the impact that it had on them. And that's, that's oftentimes the, like you both brought up a good point about, um, Mike, you read some of the background and, and got some of that, 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 um, that qualitative or the, the patient's feedback. Um, cause oftentimes after therapy in the case of chronic stroke, many times hope is lost, right? It's, it's, you know, it's when, when you can get someone excited about the potential and then show them, you know, I don't know how much we can talk about sort of the, the outcome measures that were used, but I, I did have one follow-up question. Um, was uh, spasticity at all or tone measured as part of the, the study design? Uh, I don't know if it was maybe a primary outcome or secondary, but um, can you talk to that a little bit about how that was measured? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did look at spasticity. Uh, we used the modified Ashworth scale um, and we measured spasticity at the beginning of every session over the course of the study. Uh, so the, the participants came in uh, each day during the weekday for four weeks, and we measured the modified Ashworth scale each day. And the goal there was, for this study at least, just to demonstrate that we weren't making spasticity worse. There's a question that is, if we're activating muscles with our spinal cord stimulation, that that could exacerbate the problem of spasticity because hypertonia or other types of disorders like that are overactivation of these muscles. Um, we didn't see that. So we saw sort of a stable modified Ashra scale over the course of the whole uh, trial, which, which meant we weren't exacerbating that. But we also got some uh, preliminary sort of empirical uh, information from some of the participants that their arm did feel looser or that they felt some of those um, spastic uh, symptoms being alleviated. So it's something moving forward that we're really interested in looking at um, if, if we can actually make spasticity better. Um, so that will be hopefully part of the outcomes as we continue on this clinical study. Yeah, I mean, spasticity, especially upper arm, right, is one of the most common disabilities in, in areas that stroke survivors have to kind of continuously work on, right? Um, and I know right now, um, so both my mom and my fiance's mom both suffer from spasticity, right? And they're, again, continuing to, like, Botox has been a very common treatment with this, right? Um, but yeah. Botox is also a you know, a, a filler of sorts, right? It, it's only going to support for a certain period of time. And then within three months, six months, you need your other injection before because it, it wears off over time. Do you see this technology and what, you, what you're looking to bring in with spinal cord stimulation as a support mechanism along with Botox or something that could actually change how we think about treating upper arms um, spasticity? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to kind of claim anything too big here, but the yeah. those empirical results are really promising uh, uh, to, to suggest that maybe we could replace some of those other um, uh, drug-based uh, alternatives for treating spasticity. The question of pairing like a Botox or a Baclofen um, with the sp stimulation is a really interesting one. Um, the way that Botox works is uh, it inhibits the muscle from contracting, right? So and that relieves 
uh, spasticity symptoms, but if the goal is to activate muscles so that patients can control them again, it's kind of antithetical to that goal. So uh, ideally, the, our, our technology would be able to help with spasticity while also helping them move the, that muscle again under their own control. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and don't worry, I don't think we're going to be impacting any stock prices or anything with, the, with this conversation, <laughs> but... Um, yeah. No, it's, it is a fascinating area. And, you know, again, as you, as you mentioned, right, this, it's preliminary results in this, it, it is an ongoing study. Um, so to that point before, you know, so in a minute here, we'll take a quick break, kind of get more into the business side of things and, you know, what this FDA app breakthrough means for you. But before we move into that, um, can you share a bit more around this ongoing study? And if there's ways that, you know, whether it's physicians kind of ref could refer in or, you know, survivors, caregivers that are out there listening might be able to learn more and possibly participate. Yeah, the study is ongoing uh, and um, they're still recruiting some patients uh, for the study. It's not a company run study, so it is through the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, I'd have to put you in touch with the study coordinator um, for that. Uh, which I'm not actually sure the best way to send that right now. <laughs> uh, no, it's but, okay. Yeah, we'll, we could get it after and, and put it into the show notes. But um, yeah, we'll we'll certainly point people in that direction. Cool. So yeah, let's let's take a quick break here and we'll kind of get into this hot off the news announcement of your uh, FDA approval. All right, and we're back here with Dr. Mark Powell. Um, you know, I had a great conversation there in the first half of the interview of you know, your background and really what this research means for the field of stroke rehab. Um, but now, you know, it was about February when you released the results of this preliminary study. Um, and just last week, I believe it was that you, you know, and I, when I reached, when I first saw the study and let's go back a minute, I reached out to you and said, Mark, we got to chat. Like, this is super cool stuff you're doing. You said, all right, I want to come on, but let's give us some time because I just submitted for um, FDA breakthrough device recognition. Um, we had one past guest on, uh, Brian Harris from MedRhythms, who, you know, they, they're building their uh, digital therapeutic as well. And they've gotten this breakthrough device recognition. But for those who might have missed that episode, like, let's, let's go back and just cover what FDA breakthrough device recognition means, right? Like, why did you, what made you go down this path and what opportunity is it now presenting you um, from a commercialization point of view? Yeah. So the breakthrough designation is um, really FDA's way of making sure that technologies that can be really impactful in the near term are able to get through the regulatory process um, as quickly as possible while remaining safe. Uh, and so it's it's a it's an opportunity really in, in the end for us to work with the FDA more closely than if we were to go through that process without the designation. Um, and that's really exciting for us because it means we can ask questions of the FDA um, about the study design that we're making or about the technology or a certain piece of it and have them respond much more quickly than they would otherwise. So it helps accelerate things from that perspective uh, in terms of just interactions with the FDA, um, but it also may have um, impacts for getting reimbursement for the technology once it's FDA approved. Um, so the actual um, legislation around uh, how reimbursement works through CMS and Medicare with breakthrough devices um, changes over time. And right now there's some legislation that's being proposed that would um, essentially reimburse for four years after um, FDA approval um, breakthrough devices. And so if we get that, that obviously is a huge deal because it means we can get this to more patients more quickly, um, uh, you know, and, and being reimbursed by insurance. Um I had a, a, a follow-up question along that line, Mark. Um, talking about <clears throat> when you bring this to market and um, in, in any early discovery with OTs, did 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 the, the conversations come how this can kind of help augment the therapy they're doing in clinic? Or can you talk to that a little bit? Like maybe is there, and, and the other follow-up to that would be, are you seeing any carryover from the treatment sessions, um, you know, along the lines of, of, you know, 
complementing what they might be doing with their OT as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, those things are, I think, still going to be absolutely critical to getting the most out of this technology. Um, so actually, one thing we're really excited about is the first study that we published the paper on um, didn't really have any um, any physiotherapy. Um, it was just they came in, we saw what happened when you turn on the stimulation, that kind of thing. And we saw good results. But now that um, these individuals can make movements they couldn't do before, how much better can they get if they go back to physical therapy or occupational therapy and work on those movements again? And that's actually something as we've shown some of these results to individuals who have motor impairment, some of the things that they highlight is, man, if I could do that movement again, you imagine how much better I could get if I just worked on this all the time. So absolutely, I think that's going to be a, an essential part of this. And actually, um, I think that there's ways to get that hopefully reimbursed but now if they can do movements they couldn't do before and could continue to get better, um, maybe that those will get reimbursed through the same pathways. So that's something we're really hoping to see. Um, and, and to ask, answer your question on carryover, um, by the end of the study, um, we took the device out um, and measured the, the participants came back in a month later. So there was no stimulation for a month. And we actually saw a retention of a lot of that benefit um, uh, from the study that we saw by the end of the study. So that suggests that there is physiological changes that are happening um, to the nervous system that would have more lasting effects even beyond just on and off the stimulation. I'll say that likely my sort of guess, if, you'll, if, you, if you grant me that, would be um, that those changes would slowly adapt away if the person stops using their limb. Um, and this is why therapy really is important. Um, there's a lot of aspects that that, that just can't be replaced with. Um, and, and I think that is going to be a critical part of, of the care. And that's it. Those are important points. Thank you for answering both those. And, and just, you know, just in terms of, you know, from, from working with patients for many, many years, especially with stroke, there's a high energy cost to, you know, to trying to work with a limb that that's, it's, it's not functioning and, and you're doing a lot of motions to substitute, whether it be upper extremity or lower extremity. So I can just see the potential for being able to do more. And like maybe some of your, your patients who you referred to, um, that, that they might be able to actually get a lot more done because, you know, we're all hard pressed in time in busy clinics that, within that 30 minutes or 40 minutes that they are hands-on with the therapist, I just can see that this being a nice compliment to, to be able to get to those other higher level things too, that they might be not the functional tasks that they might before, before might've been just felt impossible for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely um, what we're hoping to see here. Um, and I, I think it's important to recognize too, that, uh, physiotherapy, um, you know, it, it requires that, like that extra bit of input. So any amount of motivation or boost we can give someone, um, to continue their therapy, just the more benefit that they'll get. So it's a critical point to make. Yeah. And you see this space of, you know, we mentioned Brian Harris and, you know, med rhythms, this space of like digital therapeutics, right. So matching, you know, an app or something with devices or a pill like are where like in your long term like where where do you see this playing out into in terms of fitting within um you know the current stroke rehab pathway yeah mm -hmm. yeah so one thing that we are thinking a lot about is how can we make this um operator independent if you will uh and what we mean by that is um, making it so that it integrates seamlessly enough into the life of a patient that they could go to any physical or occupational therapy clinic and just do therapy as if the stimulation wasn't there. So there's a component of this where, um, you know, you don't have to have specially trained therapists, for example, or anything like that. It just sort of integrates into that whole care as just an, another thing that's another factor that is helping you move through that process faster. I think there's an opportunity there as well um, to have more specialized therapy that works with the stimulation in a really unique way. 
Um, you know, I think there could be other benefits that we see if you pair a certain type of or, or programming of that stimulation with a specific type of movement, for example. Um, and that will be very interesting to explore. But as a first pass, we, you know, we want this to be something that integrates into that workflow relatively seamlessly. Um, and and that's that's been pretty important to us. Nice. And, you know, when we, when we started to record here, you said, you know, you're sitting in a in an office in San Francisco um, and in the startup Mecca, well, you know, a, a startup Mecca in the U.S. Now in this remote world, you know, people are all over the place. But um, speak to like, I'd be curious, you know, as an academic right now coming into this world of startup, um, one, what has that experience been like? Um, and two, um, can you speak to kind of some of the support and maybe the accelerator program you're in and, you know, some, you know what some of these upcoming milestones are that you're looking at? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's been a learning experience, to be sure. Um, you know, I think something that you learn in academia is... Um, how to be super critical of every single thing. Uh, and then coming into the startup world, it's, it's so fast paced that there's, um, you know, new questions you're trying to answer, you know, quickly for new investors and new conversations that you're having. Uh, and, and that pace is a very big difference from academia, which typically has a lot of bureaucracy and is relatively slow moving. Um, so that I think has been the biggest shock, if you will. But, um, you know, I think, Overall, it's been a really exciting space to be in because I, I'm I'm right there next to shoulder to shoulder with so many other talented entrepreneurs that are building these amazing things and food tech and climate tech and biotech and it's really exciting to see um, and that kind of leads to this accelerator program um, that I was a part of. Uh, it's a program called Indie Bio. Uh, it's based out of they actually have two locations, but the program I was in was based out of San Francisco. Um, and it's a, it's a venture backed program that basically tries to take academic founders um, and teach them what they need to know about investments, about um, business models, and uh, how to structure all of those things. Um, and, you know, early on in that development of the company and get it to a place where you can operate as your own company, raise the money you need to and move forward. Uh, and that program was about six months. Um, with really hands-on, one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions with a really great team uh, based out of San Francisco. And um, it was a great learning experience, something that I think will really helped us kind of get to that next step of, of building our company. So with the fast pace um, that you've been at and uh, having to field uh, many, many questions, you haven't haven't come across the magic wand question on the Milk Stroke podcast yet, but we'll, we're, as we come to the close of our session, is there, um, before we do pose that question to you, um, is there, can you speak to any of the research coming down the pipeline? Is that, is that uh, off limits or can you give us any, any little tidbits of what, what's up next? <laughs> um, I, I can say, so, uh, you know, we're we're basically continuing to figure out what is the best way to to program these types of devices to give a patient the optimal results. So, the research that hopefully you'll start seeing coming out more and more over as it's as we go through this clinical study um, will be really around um, uh, how how best to use the stimulation and find the optimal set of parameters. Um, we're also very interested in how physical or occupational therapy might be paired with the stimulation, like we, we talked a little bit about. Um, and so that's uh, an area we hope to really explore a lot more. Uh, and I think that we can see potentially a lot more benefit than we've seen even just with stimulation alone um, down that path. Great. And um, I think our, you know, as we get again closer to this famous uh, magic wand question, one one thing I'd be curious, and I'm sure we have an audience of international folks, they might be questioning if there's any CE mark approvals coming in the future that you're thinking about. Um, you know, obviously FDA right now, US markets where you're based, but where do you do you see that in the short, shorter long term roadmap? Where where do you think that plays out? Um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, we have uh 
a European co-founder, you know, it's definitely something that we're thinking of, uh, of bringing this to the European market and, and beyond. Um, yeah, right now we're focused on FDA. Like you mentioned, that's where we're, we're based. Um, but I think that the nice thing about the FDA and its rigor is that many other um, regulatory bodies in the world look to FDA. And if you can get through the FDA, then uh, you have a better chance of getting through some of those regulatory pathways as well. Sure. Well, we interviewed a, a uh, Dr. Nick Ward out of uh, Univer or Queens, Queens College London, who is a uh, upper arm rehab guru. So I'd, I'd say either it'd be a good person, you know, to have a chat with if you don't know already, but I'm sure I hope he's listening. And I, I know he, uh, he was quite interested in this. He, he was chatting with me a couple of weeks ago, and he was looking forward to this episode. So it's um, look, it really brilliant stuff that you're you're providing and, and you know we Dave and I say this all the time it's like as we have these interviews and we speak with folks like yourselves you know transitioning into from academia and kind of bringing these new innovations to life you know it pro provides such optim or optimism to the community of stroke survivors and those like caregivers and you know everyone involved that there's folks like yourselves out there thinking of these new ways to take a condition that ultimate that always has been kind of said, look, you're, yeah, there's no hope. And now there's just new things on the horizon. So, you know, thank you for, and the team for all your hard work. And, you know, hopefully as you continue to hit these new milestones, um, we could have you on as a reoccurring guest. Um, but you'll, you will have to come up with a new magic wand question. So let's hear your first <laughs> Uh, so we're going to hand you the magic wand here, um, Mark, and ask you, you know, if you could take that to redesign the stroke care pathway with all your understanding of, you know, the impairments, what would you, how would that look, right? What would you do to redesign it? Yeah, um, I've thought a little bit about this uh, you know, since learning about the question, but um, I, I think honestly, the thing that we can change, and I think this is actually a change we don't need a magic wand for, um, is giving stroke patients and their families and their caregivers better information about what's next. Like, what are the steps of that um, rehab journey? Because I've spoken with people who just spend hours and hours looking up different options and what next and who to go to and things like that. And it's it's not a, a seamless process by any means today. Um, you know, getting handed off from a neurologist to a physiatrist to a physical therapist, that whole pathway can be really confusing, can be really scary for people um, and frustrating if if it's not done properly. You know, I, I know individuals who um, felt that the, the PT prescription that they got was really just inadequate to help them and that they would have been better if they had a different kind of physical therapy or one that was focused more on rehab versus adapting around a deficit, for example. Um, so I think, honestly, building a, a, a way for that information to flow more easily and to get to patients and their families almost by default. And I, I think that that's something that this podcast, for example, I really commend you on, is trying to build that awareness. And, and that's something that will really help everybody move through this pathway. And, and another thing kind of on the same point um, is uh, hospital systems today aren't always, in some cases they are, but aren't always built to have a really seamless communication between different entities within the hospital. So I talked about that neurologist to physiatrist. If you include our therapy in that, uh, a neurosurgeon may enter into the picture as well. Um, and if all of those different departments aren't able to coordinate, kind of become a seamless team for a patient, um, it could really cause things to slow down. Uh, and so I really commend uh, those hospitals which do have very integrated, tight teams, uh, some of whom you actually met, you've interviewed on this episode uh, or on this podcast before. Um, and I really admire those types of programs, but it's something that I need, I think we should see kind of more broadly um, uh, done. And I think those two changes uh, will, will really make a big impact on stroke care. Mark, thank you for that answer. And, and thank you again. I'm going to echo the compliments that, that uh, Mike offered that, you know, thank you for um, working on this mission and you and your team. Um, and I can tell you ab ab absolutely have done your homework. <laughs> you know, the barriers to and the disconnect that 
um, many survivors and caregivers face. And um, we're definitely going to be following you along on your journey and um, sharing, hopefully, as the news continues to, to you know, the, the good work that you do continues to reap rewards. Um, we hope that uh, we can have you back on at some point as well. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you. All right, Mark. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, best of luck with with the next few months and milestones. I'm sure we'll be we hearing all about it. Take I care. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.